الإسلام ديني ومحمدا رسول الله ويقيني أدنو إليه ساجدا بجبيني اقبل صلاة بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ما بعد. So as you all know, uh, this will be the final lecture for my sojourn in this uh, city, and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bring it to a conclusion upon baraka and khair. And I was thinking about which topic to give, and obviously it was something to do with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. In the last few months, I have been thinking what should be the last one. And uh, I narrowed it down to two or three, and one of our uh, brothers came up to me a few days ago and basically suggested one of them in my head. So I said, Bismillah, I think that is the one to, to, to finish off with. Uh, and in reality, I was hesitant to do this topic that I will be doing today for the simple reason that one lecture does not do justice to it. It was in my mind for a while to do. But this topic, Wallahi, you will see for yourself, we will be rushing over so many points and Without exaggeration, this topic could easily have been done in maybe 10 lessons. It would have been some justice to it. But inshallah, at least something is better than nothing as the saying goes. And what I wanted to do today is to go over why we believe that our Prophet ﷺ was the single most successful person the single greatest leader, the single greatest educator, the single greatest human being who has ever come in the history of mankind. And the reason why this is difficult is because how do you enumerate? How do you put on a list that which doesn't really have an end? And as well, when you mention every single point, there are literally dozens of examples and sometimes I won't even have time to give you any example. So this is one of those points that, okay, well, I'll give you a brief lecture today. But in reality, the entire seerah, you can cut and paste and use as examples over all of these points. So what we're going to do today is I will go over specifically 31 points that are universally acknowledged by anybody of intelligence that are traits and characteristics of successful leaders, successful movers and shakers. You will not be a successful leader unless you have some or all or most of these characteristics. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had all of them and even more than them. And he had perfected all of them. So what we're going to do today is go over 31 characteristics and why did I choose 31 simply because of timing literally I was going over this today and I had to stop because of time We only have one lecture to do and so every point is gonna have maybe two or three minutes and then inshallah ta'ala move on I'll try to give at least one example if I don't then that's because it is self-evident and you can find your own examples and if you read any book on leadership any book on being a, even in a successful ceo you will come across some or all of these points and we will apply them to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and demonstrate how perfect of a role model and how successful of a leader he was and obviously a leader is always the most successful of any group so when we say the prophet sallam is the most successful leader automatically we imply he is the most successful human being in the history of mankind by any measure the whole point of this lecture, you don't even have to be a Muslim to acknowledge that he is the most successful leader in all of human history. And that is why I've also tried to compi compile some quotes that have been done by non-Muslims who have studied the seerah, by philosophers, by intellectuals who have studied the seerah, and they have come to the same conclusion that the single greatest leader in the history of mankind, without a doubt, must be our Prophet sallallahu alayhi and I'll begin by quoting you a book that most of us have heard growing up. It was written almost 40 years ago in the 70s. And it, uh, it, uh, it went on the New York Times bestseller and whatnot. And it was by a famous intellectual of the last generation, Michael Hart. And he wrote his famous book, The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in human history. Right? This is a book that became famous in the 70s. And uh, it was uh, a book that basically compiled the summaries, literally, of The 100. And the number one out of this list, and we all know who it is because we've heard about this book growing up, but very few of us have actually read that, that introductory chapter.
chapter, the number one on this list is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, and I quote from his book, my choice of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers. Remember, he's not a Muslim, and most of the people I'll quote today are not going to be Muslim. May surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was successful, sorry, who was supremely successful on both the religious and the secular level. This is what Michael Hart wrote. And in fact, even he is being limiting because he only says religious and secular and we will see on many levels. So let us begin. Number one, to be a true leader, you must be a visionary and bring forth something new, a new product, a new model, a new vision. You must bring something new or else you're not a leader, you're a follower. To be a leader, you must be a, a person who brings something new to the table. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't just bring something new in one area, in one department. In reality, this one point can be spent at least four or five lectures. He brought everything new, a new theology a new ethics, a new law. He had a new society in mind. And this is a topic that in and of itself, we go, go into so many tangents. He brought totally a different paradigm. His model of a society was completely different than the world that he lived in. And this is something that is well acknowledged by many people. The famous uh, Russian philosopher Leo Tolstoy, he wrote that the legislation of the Quran will spread all over the world because it agrees with mind, with logic, and with wisdom. This is Tolstoy writing that the Quranic example, the prophetic example, it is unparalleled. One of the greatest minds of England of the last century H.G. Wells, who wrote many famous novels. H.G. Wells writes, The Islamic teachings have left great traditions for equitable and gentle dealings in behavior and inspired people with nobility and tolerance. These are human teachings of the highest order and at the same time practicable. Not only are they idealistic, but they're also realistic. These teachings brought into existence a society in which hard-heartedness and collective impression and injustice were the least as compared to other societies. Islam is replete with gentleness, courtesy, and fraternity, end quote. So a unique vision, bringing something totally different onto the plate. Number two, to be a leader, to be a successful leader, you must have sincerity. You must have motivation. You must show that ikhlas to the people around you. And no one can doubt the ikhlas of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His entire seerah from the beginning to the end is an example of that ikhlas and self-motivation. He was not motivated by anything other than the true pleasure of Allah and this is something that foe and enemy friend and foe alike they must acknowledge every single incident from the famous one in which uh, Abu Talib says to him what do you want we'll give you everything the Quraysh came through Abu Talib and said that the kingdom will give you power will give you money will give you fame will give you and of course that famous quote which is one of the most famous quotes of the seerah if they gave me the power of the sun and the moon I would not abandon what I am doing and this is something that is readily acknowledged even by those who don't believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Montgomery Watt of the last generation he was was one of the famous Orientalists uh, uh, of England and he died in 1953. Montgomery, uh, sorry, he died in the 60s but his book was written in 53, sorry. Montgomery Watt, when he's writing a seerah, he was one of the first non-Muslims to write a sympathetic seerah in the 1950s, like one generation ago. One of the first non-Muslims. He has a book called Muhammad in Mecca, another called Muhammad in Medina. These two books, they form the basis for sympathetic seerah amongst non-Muslims. Before him, generally it was very unsympathetic. Montgomery Watt writes his readiness to undergo persecutions for his belief the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader and the greatness of his ultimate achievement all argue for his fundamental integrity all evidences prove his fundamental integrity then he says, and this is a problem that still irritates non-Muslims to this day, to suppose Muhammad وسلم, was an imposter raises more problems than it solves. You understand this point? To make the supposition that he was a liar, that he didn't believe in what he's saying, it's actually more problematic than the 
obvious, which is that the truth, moreover, none of the great figures of history is so poorly appreciated in the West as is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Montgomery Watt is basically saying to claim that he wasn't sincere actually creates more problems than to claim that he was sincere. Everything points that he was indeed sincere. And I remember on a personal level, on an anecdote as well, that when I was at Yale, one of my you know, professors, world famous figure, or obviously everybody there is world famous. So we are having very frank conversations. And I even brought up this point, like what do you think is the motivation? Like why would this man come وسلم, and start preaching this message? And my own professor, who's an agnostic, he said, oh, I have no doubt that he was sincere. I have no doubt that he believed he was a prophet. So the sincerity is not really challenged by any serious researcher. And this is the sign of a good leader. The third sign that we're going to mention is the fact that the Prophet wasallam had to undergo personal struggles in his own life to become a leader. In other words, look at where he began and look at where he ended. He was born into a family that was relatively unknown. He was obscure by, by and large, of, of even of the civilizations, the Arab civilization was one of the most backward at the time. He didn't have wealth that he was born into. He didn't have power. He wasn't born in a line of kings. In fact, everything that he did, Allah Azza wa allowed him to create his own legacy with the help of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He began with nothing, orphaned at birth, without even money throughout his early years, without any power behind him, without any army, without even a formal education. And yet look at where he went in the short span of a lifetime. One of England's most famous philosophers of the last generation, Thomas Carlyle, he writes that one other circumstance we must not forget, meaning of the Prophet that he had no school learning of the thing, that he had no education. The art of writing was just introduced and it seems that he couldn't even write life in the desert was all of his education and despite all of this his wisdom that that he learned was in a manner that basically I'm translating I'm, I'm paraphrasing that he he learned all that he did from the meager circumstances around him and he still created what he did so the personal struggle of a person to rise from nothing it's one thing that you're the son of a king and you create a better empire okay it's one thing you're born the son of a billionaire and then you become even more wealthy but to be born with very very meager circumstance without even parents alive when you're growing up and yet to create the world that he did by the pleasure and the blessings of Allah no doubt look at how leadership is done and from where to where did our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam go point number four to be a leader you have to be confident you have to have that sense of self-confidence exude that sense of character and confidence and your followers need to sense that as well a true leader has to believe in his own product and be its champion and Karen Armstrong, the famous, you know, uh, uh, educator of our time, she's still alive. Karen Armstrong, she says that Islam is a religion of success. Unlike Christianity, Karen Armstrong was a nun. She was a believing Christian for over 25 years of her life. She was a, dedicated her life to the church. If she says anything about Christianity, she has the full right to, to, to say so. Unlike Christianity, which has as its main image, in the West at least, a man dying in a devastating, disgraceful, helpless death, Muhammad وسلم, was not an apparent failure. He was a dazzling success, politically as well as spiritually, and Islam went from strength to strength to strength this is Karen Armstrong writing the strength of character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam point number five to be a leader you must be eloquent you cannot be a leader when you are not eloquent and you must have effective communication skills you must be an effective speaker an effective public speaker and there is no question that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given as he himself said I have been given the most concise and precise of speech I have been given the most succinct of speech and we study the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every day after Isha when I'm here we do Riyadhul Salihin and we derive so many pearls from what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and also, uh, also when you look at his khutbas when you see how he impacted people through his speech one of the Arabists i.e. the person who would compile Arabic dictionaries and uh, was an expert in the Arabic language and he wrote the famous dictionary Stanley Lane Poole his dictionary is very famous Stanley Lane Poole he lived in Egypt many years this is back in the 1800s. He writes that 
Those who saw him were suddenly filled with reverence. Those who came near him loved him. Those who described him would say, I have never seen anyone before him or like him, uh, after him like him. And he was of great tacit taciturnity, means he spoke little. But when he spoke, it was with emphasis and deliber deliberation. And no one could forget what he said. This is Stanley Lane Poole writing about the eloquence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Point number six, to be an effective leader, you cannot be a coward you have to be courageous you have to be bold you have to be decisive and in the entire 63 years of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never once did he even indicate the whiff of fear never once did he have any doubt never once was cowardice displayed from him this despite the fact that he was physically attacked assassins came to kill him arrows were thrown at him spears were lodged in his own face and mouth and in fact during some of the battles he was the one at the very forefront the companions fled in the battle of Hunayn and the Prophet ﷺ stayed put as the arrows were coming he's saying come to me come to me that is what you call courage hadith in Sahih Bukhari that at night there was a large crowd a large cry that came out a large sound we didn't know what it was we came out of our houses timidly and we found the Prophet ﷺ had already jumped on the horse of a Sahabi without even a saddle he had his and his, his sword around his neck hanging and he had already come back from the place of the noise saying you have nothing to fear you have nothing to fear this is the true leader courageous at the very forefront in fact the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the one the Sahaba would turn to at times of distress and they would get uplifted point number seven to be a leader you have to be persuasive you have to be able to convince people of your message and look at how many people he convinced from the very early beginnings of Islam when the tribal chieftain Amr ibn Abbas came and there was only Bilal and Abu Bakr and he said to him, who are you? He said, I'm a prophet. He said, what is a prophet? Never heard of a prophet. And within a five minute conversation, Amr ibn Abbas accepts Islam. To the number of pagans and mushrikuns who converted, to the chief rabbi of Medina who converted, simply by looking at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to that chieftain who was a Christian of the uh, lands of Yemen, Adi ibn Hatim, who came to him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam persuaded all of those people to believe in him and not only that he continued to persuade people even those that have never seen him like us we are persuaded by his truth and his uh, character imagine you don't even we haven't even seen the Prophet ﷺ, and we are yaqeen that he is indeed the Rasulullah and this is something that one of the greatest leaders of Christianity of our times Pope John Paul II he acknowledged when he said the religiosity of Muslims deserve respect it is impossible not to admire their fidelity to their prophet to their prayer the image of the believers in Allah who without caring for time and place fall on their knees and immerse themselves in prayer remains a model for those who invoke the true God in particular for those Christians who having deserted their cathedrals pray only very little end quote in other words Pope John Paul the second is saying the faithfulness of the Muslims in believing in their prophet we as Christians should learn from that how dedicated they are that they are observant and this goes back to we are persuaded by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though we haven't even seen him we believe in his message even though we haven't heard his own voice and this leads me to the next point point number eight that it's one thing to follow it's another thing to be loyal people follow sometimes out of greed sometimes out of fear but loyalty comes from the heart and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inspired loyalty like no other person. Heraclius' question to Abu Sufyan, has anyone ever abandoned the faith after having embraced it? And he said, no, no one has ever embraced the faith and then accepted. Point number nine, you can be loyal, but then to have that combination of fear and love and respect is something that only the Muslims have for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The leader inspires true love and not just just loyalty not just we agree and we're obeying but we want to genuinely sacrifice for you and of course there are so many examples amongst them the famous one 
when the Quraysh and the Mushrikun tricked uh, after Bi'r Ma'una, they tricked some of the Sahaba and they massacred them. And the famous incident of Zayd ibn Wathana having been brought to the execution and one of the people taunted him, don't you wish that Muhammad was in your place? And his famous response, no wallahi, I would rather die than even a thorn prick the foot of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And no, but he's not lying, he's about to die. He doesn't even know his words are going to be recorded and remembered in history. That sense of genuine love and respect that we all know and those outside of our faith, they mock our faith for sometimes going to excesses and there is true sometimes, some Muslims do, but that genuine love that comes is the sign of a true believer. Gandhi, believe it or not. And by the way, why are all of these readers and, and, and intellectuals quoting the Prophet ﷺ and talking about him? Very simple. Leaders study other, other leaders. Philosophers study other thinkers. So when I quote all of these people, imagine Tolstoy in Russia in the 1850s is studying the Prophet Sallallahu I'm going to quote Napoleon. Why is Napoleon studying the seerah? I'm, I'm quoting Gandhi. Why is Gandhi studying the seerah? Why? Because every mover and shaker is wise enough to know I need to study the movers and shakers before me. Every true leader is humble enough to know let me see what the previous guys did so that I can learn from their good and then uh, implement it. So Gandhi writes in, in one of his writings that I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword by violence that won a place for Islam. No, it was the rigid simplicity the utter self-effacement, meaning humility of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for his pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his fearlessness, and his absolute trust in God and his own mission. When I closed the second volume of the Prophet's biography, I told you about the two volumes, Gandhi read it. When I closed the second volume, Gandhi is saying, I was sorry there was not more for me to read of that great life. This is Gandhi saying, I wanted to read more. Only two volumes in English I found and I wanted to read more. Point number 10, a true leader must be humble. Humility is the characteristic of a genuine bona fide mover and shaker. No one likes arrogance and generally speaking, typically power breeds arrogance. Typically when you're in charge, you become egotistical, you become maniacal. Typically when you have the, the kingdom and you are the boss, then you become like Fir'aun or you become like the tyrants we see throughout human history. It is extremely rare to find a humble leader and yet the lifestyle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his his genuine humility cannot be doubted by anyone. He would not even like that the Sahaba stood up in his presence. He ate and lived like everyone else. He sat down on the floor to eat the food that was given to him. He couldn't be told apart from his own followers. When somebody entered the room, they would find everybody dressed exactly the same. Reverend Bosworth, one of the Scottish uh, uh, Orientalists of the, of the uh, last generation and also somebody who opened the door for studying Islam in a more sympathetic light. He wrote in 1874, 150 years ago, he wrote, and he, he has a small biography of the Prophet Sassim. He wrote, he was the Caesar and the Pope in one, but he was the Pope without the Pope's pretensions and the Caesar without the legions of Caesar. In other words, without the fancy clothing and without the army of the leaders, without any bodyguard, without a palace, without a standing army, without a fixed revenue. If ever any man had the right to say that he ru ruled by divine right, it was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for he had all the power without its instruments and without its supporters. So this is Reverend Bosworth writing about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Point number 11, a true leader has to act strategically and make the best of every situation. And this is something we find of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in every circumstance, no matter what he had he made the best of it and he comes out a winner the entire life is a strategy uh, the entire seerah is a strategy of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if you listen to any lecture of mine or any seerah chapter you will find this strategic excellence of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam point number 12 to be a true leader there must be a combination between strictness and compassion between mercy and between justice that that perfect combination is so rare when should you be strict and when should you be merciful when should you be more just when should you be more compassionate and that is something that almost every leader falls into here or there on occasion but our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
managed to strike the perfect balance between strictness and justice on the one side and compassion and mercy on the other. And again, the entire seerah is a testimony to this. As I have said many times in my seerah, the general rule was compassion and mercy. Sometimes he would forgive his worst enemies and this was the default. And the conquest of Mecca demonstrates this. But at other times, very rarely, but when the time called for it, he extracted justice and he showed what it means to disobey also deserves to be punished and there are a number of incidents the incident of Kaab ibn Ashraf or the execution of specific people on the conquest of Mecca that combination of compassion and strictness of justice and mercy our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam perfected it point number 13 a true leader manages himself self-management almost every leader has a mini army of staffs of PAs of secretaries who micromanage look at any leader you will have one secretary for this and one that and one chauffeur and one this and that yet who can say that like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did everything himself he didn't have an official secretary he didn't have an official chauffeur he did all of his own work including as Aisha said milking his own goat and sewing and mending his own clothes along with meeting the famous delegations and along with taking charge of the army affairs making sure who's standing where no delegation he is in charge and he's managing himself everything from top to bottom what leader can even do this in our times every leader needs an entire mini army to micromanage and to delegate but our prophet did not have that he did everything on his own point number 14 a leader cares about the followers and the genuine care there is an interest in those who follow you to make sure that they are taken care of and our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would genuinely care about the sahaba he would know when someone had not showed up he would know if somebody didn't come what happened where is so and so in the famous incident of tabuk when the entire army has left medina and a lone person comes from the distance he says let it be abu dhar how did he even know that abu dhar is missing from the entire army the whole army is there of a thousand five hundred people and he knows Abu Dhar is not there so when he sees the one man walking he says let it be Abu Dhar just imagine I re remarked at that point in time look at his monitoring of everybody over there the beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari where that little baby boy Anas ibn Malik's younger brother he used to have a pet uh, bird remember that story I mentioned it right and the boy was missing for a day or two and then he came really sad and really distressed and he didn't have the bird and the Prophet is noticing the boy is just like a three-year-old, four-year-old little kid. And the Prophet notices the kid is in distress. He is crying. So he says the famous statement, Ya Aba Umair ma fa'ala nughair. That, oh Abu Numair, he made a kunya for the boy. What happened to your little pet bird? This is what you call the care and the concern of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As well, we have again told story, the same person that I, I mentioned before. Tolstoy, by the way, he wrote a brief, brief pamphlet. Again, this is almost 200 years ago in Russia. Can you imagine? I don't know what his sources were. I don't know where he got his information from. But he wrote about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He has a little treatise called who is Muhammad? This is Leo Tolstoy, the famous you know, Russian intellectual uh, of the uh, early 19th century, that he writes in his booklet, there is no doubt that the Prophet Muhammad is one of the greatest reformers at the service of social improvement. Suffice to say that he led a whole nation to the enlightenment of truth and made it more inclined towards tranquility, peace, and modesty, preventing it from shedding blood and from offering human sacrifice, meaning the pre-Islamic Arabs. This great task that can be carried out only by an exceptionally strong man. And such a man deserves to be regarded with respect and admiration. This is Tolstoy speaking about, again, the care that the Prophet ﷺ had for his followers. Number 15, to be a leader, to be a true visionary, you need to have a very clear goal in mind. You, to be a visionary, you have to have a vision. You have to have a mission. And our Prophet ﷺ had the greatest mission known to mankind. And that is to take them out of the darkness of shirk to the light of Tawheed. And in particular, his own people to unite the Arabs the Quraysh and then all of the Arabs and then eventually all of mankind upon the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what a noble vision look at other leaders their goal is to make money other leaders their goal is to make one product other leaders whatever they have the noble goal of our Prophet sallam, the concrete vision the high mission Thomas Carlyle again one of the greatest minds of England of the last century he has a book called Heroes and Hero Worship and it's about heroes and about the admiration 
generation of those heroes. He has a whole chapter about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thomas Carlyle, he wonders, he remarks, how could one man single-handedly weld together the warring tribes and the Bedouins into the most powerful and civilized nation on earth in less than two decades. How could one man do this? A silent great soul, one that who cannot be anything but earnest. He must be sincere. He was a kindle to the world, a light to the world. The world's maker, Allah Azza wa Jal, had ordered this so. Thomas Carlyle is saying he is a rahmatan lil alameen only because Allah Azza wa Jal made him that way number 16 one of the one of the characteristics of a true leader is not only do you have a vision but you achieve that goal you are in fact successful and that is something that again our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam demonstrated there are many who never live to see the success they never live to see the fruits of their efforts there are many who fail along the way how many of those who attempt to get to their goal and never get to the end for some have said for every successful leader leader there are 99 that are unsuccessful for every successful engineer or not engineer what do you call it the, the patent you're the, the in, inventor for every successful inventor maybe 999 are unsuccessful these are just they say Allah Azza wa knows the exact ratio despite all the odds the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam succeeded and that is the sign of a true leader Edward Gibbon that famous philosopher and historian who wrote the rise and fall of the Roman Empire he is the of the 17th century I 300 years ago Edward Gibbon he writes that it is not the propagation but the permanency of his religion that deserves our wonder it's not just that he taught it's the fact that it remained he was successful the Muhammadans, again he's writing in 1700, the Muhammadans is what they called him, have uniformly withstood the temptation of reducing their object of their faith and their devotion to a level with the senses and imaginations of man. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is the simple profession of Islam. This is uh, the Edward Gibbon writing. The intellectual image of God has never been degraded to an idol. The honors of the Prophet have never transgressed beyond the measure of human virtue and his ideas have remained amongst his disciples within the bounds of reason and religion i.e. he is saying the message that the Prophet came with it has lasted and in, he goes on and on Indians, Africans, Turks they have all taken this message and they have implemented it this is somebody writing 350 years ago and he's marveling we're not surprised that the Prophet taught we're surprised that the message lasted so much and all of these diverse people are implementing it number seven to be a true leader is to lead by example actions speak louder than words he didn't just talk sallallahu alayhi wasallam he led by example he was literally in the trenches in the battle of the trench he was at the forefront of every major battle he was at the head of the army in Hunain he himself participated in the assembly line of carrying bricks when the masjid is being built and the list goes on and on he led by example and not just by command and speech he himself did the same chores he himself walked when people had to walk in the famous incident where in the battle of Tabuk they had to share three people to a camel Ali radiallahu anhu said Ya Rasulullah you know me and my, my colleague we will, we will uh, walk and you stay on the camel and he smiled and he said neither are the two of you any stronger than I am nor am I in any less need of the ajr than you two we will share equally on the camel all three of them then shared the camel he's leading by example when we read about his simplicity he set the standard so high that none of us can even come close to it when we read about his worship and tahajjud we marvel how could he do that and still do what he did in every area he led not only by action but also by example not just talk but demonstrating what it means number 18 a successful leader manages diverse groups of people not just one category of people. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he managed people from all different backgrounds, from all different races. W. Montgomery Watt, again, the famous person who wrote Muhammad in Mecca and Muhammad in Medina, the two volumes. He says in his second volume, Muhammad in Medina, we may distinguish from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi three gifts. The first of them, he says that he could, you know, he was like a prophet and whatnot. The second is that his wisdom as a statesman, making a, making a community of Islam. And the third, there is his skill 
and his tact as an administrator and his wisdom in the choice of men to whom to delegate administrative detail. In other words, the fact that he has the people around him that he is choosing and giving uh, various tasks to, managing diverse groups of people despite their socioeconomic differences, despite their racial differences, he brings all of them together under the banner of Islam. And this leads me to point number 19. Not only does he bring them together, but he unites them equally, which was something unprecedented in human history. No one before him ever brought together people who hated one another, who had racial prejudices, who had genuine stereotypes and destroyed those stereotypes so that they became more beloved to each other than even their blood brothers. No leader has ever done this. Before the Prophet ﷺ, there was racism. There was socioeconomic stratas as we know. After that, all Muslims came together and they put their differences aside. They put their prejudices aside. The slaves worked alongside the slave masters, the Arab and the non-Arab. All of them worked together equally. And in fact, they gave seniority based on Islam, not based upon race, which was something that, as you know, the Quraysh could not understand. And some of the later converts really found troubling. How could you put Bilal ahead of the other people? And we have here a quote from uh, a, a particular uh, famous uh, person in the Indian independence movement from Bengal, uh, somebody called the Nightingale of India, Sarojini Naudi. I don't know how to pronounce it. Naudi. Naudi. Naidu, okay, Naidu, okay. She has a little treaty. She was a follower of Gandhi, by the way, and she played a major role against the British uh, from the state of Bengal. Uh, she has this quote about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was the first religion that preached and practiced true democracy. By democracy, she means equality here. For in the mosque, when the call for prayer is sounded and the worshippers are gathered, the democracy of Islam is embodied five times a day when the peasant and the king kneel side by side and proclaim together Allahu Akbar. No other tradition, no other ideology brought together enemies and made them brothers under the banner of whatever the ideology was other than Islam. Point number 20, a true leader nurtures talent. He fosters creativity. A true leader sees what every person is capable of and then channels them in that direction. And we see this throughout the seerah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose the right people to be the leaders for whatever they did. He chose he encouraged Hassan ibn Thabit to become the poet that he did. He told uh, Abu Huraira to, to give special time with him for hadith because he would become the one who narrated hadith. Every Sahabi's talent, the Prophet ﷺ chose that Sahabi for that task and then gave him what was needed for that Sahabi to become who he was. So to see the talent in others and to nurture it. Point number 21, the Prophet, uh, a, a true leader must always be optimistic, always have a positive attitude and never once in the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ, did he have a negative attitude. Never did the people around him feel down and depressed because of him. Wherever he went he exuded positivity. In fact in early Makkah when the Muslims were being persecuted and they came to complain to the Prophet ﷺ, how long are we going to you know, last in this, in this persecution? The Prophet ﷺ cheered them up even when they were being killed and cut to shreds. He gave them optimism even though there was little for them to be optimistic about from a practical standpoint. In the famous uh, incident of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when even Umar ibn al-Khattab is saying, how can we do this? How can we do this? Until finally, Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed, inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. And the Prophet said, O oh, Umar, it is a fatah from Allah. How? What? Umar didn't care. When he heard it's a fatah from Allah, he started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, this is a fatah. This is what you call optimism, trust, yaqeen, certainty. Simply to hear it is a conquest from Allah, a victory from Allah, and Umar is cheered up. There is a victory. He didn't know how, he didn't understand what is going on, but once he hears from the Prophet, system, this is a victory, that's all that he needs. So giving that sense of optimism, that positivity, is a sign of a leader and our Prophet was never down. He was never somebody who gave off negative vibes, making somebody feel you know, even worse on that day. Not once in his entire life. Point number 22, emotional stability. 
is the sign of a true leader. A true leader is stable. A true leader doesn't have tantrums. He doesn't have fits. He doesn't have a bad, you know, uh, uh, something negative or something uh, to say that goes against his character. And once again, we have in the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ, not once what we can call an emotional breakdown. Subhanallah, there is no human being except that once in a while he or she loses it. There is no human being. Look at the biographies of any president, any, even those that are admired, once in a while they have their bad days. Go read those that are close to them. Even the closest of the people who they know, you know, once in a while something's gonna happen. He's gonna say something vulgar. He's gonna have a tantrum, an emotional breakdown, something of this nature. But no, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his entire lifetime acted in a dignified manner always in control always emotionally stable always the dignity is there no human being can claim this point number 23 to live an entire life of integrity of ethical behavior not one single scandal what leader can claim this look around us now what is going on and not just around us any time in the past where there is power where there is fame where there is money heck throw all of that out of the way any human being you have your dark skeletons this is what it means to be a human being but our prophet sallam, are there any dark skeletons not a single one no corruption no embezzlement of funds nothing even coming close to a scandal and it is impossible for any person to do this even those that are generally successful there are things lurking in the back that are negative but not so for our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once again thomas carlyle he writes bigots claim that muhammad sought personal fame prestige and rule no the son of the desert, the man with the greatest of souls, the merciful, the passionate, the revered, the wise. He had a great heart, void of worldly aspirations. He had excellent intentions. He was not seeking the upper hand with his silent soul. He was one of those men who cannot be but faithful and serious. The ethical behavior, something that is uh, indicated even by those who don't believe in Islam. Point number 24, and this is again absolutely amazing. Not only did he have ethical behavior, not only is he embodying the highest level of integrity, but he creates that integrity in his followers. Those who follow him, they improve their lives even in private. What leader can do this? Think about it. Even if there's a good leader, the people around him are generally going to be corrupt or there's going to be some corrupt or there's going to be some charlatans and opportunists amongst them. But those around the Prophet Sallallahu they absorbed his akhlaq and they wanted to follow it. Not only did he raise the bar, his followers, all of them were inspired to raise their own bar and to try to embody the values of the Prophet in their own lives and those followers after them up until our times the love that is manifest to our Prophet even amongst us you know 14 centuries later 45 generations have gone between us and the Prophet and still we want to know what is Sunnah how did he act how should we act and walk in his footsteps S.P. Scott a historian uh, from America he writes a history of the Moorish Empire in Europe he says if the object of religion be the inculcation of morals and the diminution of evil, meaning to, to eliminate evil, and the promotion of human, human happiness and the expansion of the human intellect, if the performance of good works will avail in the great day when mankind shall be summoned to its final reckoning, it is neither irre irreverent nor unreasonable to admit that Muhammad wasallam was indeed a prophet of God. Meaning, to summarize, what he's saying is, if you're going to judge religion by the impact it has on his followers, there is no question that Muslims have been impacted by their prophet more than any other person. If a prophet is judged by his impact on his followers, no group on earth has been impacted more by their own prophet than the Muslims have by the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Point number 25 of the signs of a true leader is to recover after a tragedy, to come back after something negative happens. And 
our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suffered a number of setbacks, a number of calamities, and he kept on rebounding back after every single one of them. We don't like to think about those negative times or we gloss over them, but imagine a dead carcass thrown onto him and he is there while people are laughing around him. Imagine the public humiliation, his own uncles going behind him yelling out, don't listen to this man, he's a madman. Imagine on the day of Uhud, he has to flee to save his own life. Imagine on the incident of Ta'if once again he has to take care of his own uh, protection by running away from the people of Ta'if and yet to recover time and time again after every one of those calamities and to rebound back even stronger and to rise even higher this is the sign of a true leader point number 26 one of the most amazing signs of this leadership of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that really cannot be replicated is the swiftness of his success the swiftness of his success how quickly he changed the course of history 23 years was his time of being a prophet and of them only 10 when he was politically engaged the first 13 is just da'wah only 10 years where there's politics and there's wars going on and yet he changed the entire course of history in that short period of time how many people strive for years decades maybe even they'll just lay the foundations and die and somebody else will then reap the benefits of that research and work but our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not just in one life time but in one decade was able to accomplish what no one else was able to accomplish in many many centuries one of the great philosophical historians will durant he has a, a multi-volume book about the history of philosophy well known anybody who knows philosophy knows will durant will durant he's one of the greatest minds really of the last century he writes about the influence of the prophet on world history and he says in one paragraph in the year 565 the emperor justinian died the master of a great empire justinian is the emperor of rome the average human being has never heard of him yet in his time he was the pinnacle five years later muhammad Sassim is born into a poor family in a country three quarters of which is desert sparsely people by nomad tribes whose total wealth could hardly have furnished the sanctuary of Hagia Sophia you know the famous Hagia Sophia all of the people of Mecca couldn't even have taken care of one church in terms of their qualifications no one in those years would have dreamed that within a century those nomads would have conquered half of Byzantine Asia, all of Persia, all of Egypt, most of North Africa, and be on their way to Spain. The explosion of the Arabian Peninsula into the conquest and conversion of half of the Mediterranean world, and I quote, is the most extraordinary phenomenon in medieval history, end quote. The most extraordinary phenomenon. No one could have predicted the sharp turn of history with the coming of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is one of the big questions that is asked, what if he hadn't come? History would have had a whole different course. The impact that he has had on history is something that truly we can say no one changed the course of history like he did. Again, even if you're a non-Muslim, this is something you have to acknowledge. Point number 27, with all of this success, you would think he had had so much resources but no limited means limited followers yet the impact was beyond measure very finite resources yet the amount of impact he had is literally beyond measure think about it how much wealth did he have in his personal life even the Arabs how much wealth did they have think about it how many armies did he have how much weaponry how much power think about it hardly anything and yet with that small amount literally the entire course of history is changed Alfred Gulliam uh, died in 1965 who was one of these Arabist professors at Oxford uh, he used to teach Islamic studies at Oxford uh, two generations ago and also at SOAS Alfred Gulliam he writes Muhammad Sassam accomplished in his purpose in the course of three small engagements he means Badr Uhud and the conquest of Mecca three small engagements the number of combatants never exceeding a few thousand but in importance they rank the, amongst the world's most decisive incidents in other words what he is saying is very small amounts of people and yet it changed the entire course of humanity point number 28 to be a true leader personal family life how many are the leaders they are successful in business but a failure at home 
how many are the leaders they can become the greatest politically but their children suffer their families suffer almost all great leaders almost all of them their success comes at some failure and typically that failure is in the families this is the reality yet our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam managed to raise successful children his families were the best of families he managed multiple relationships with his wives and point number 29 following up from that not only was his personal life successful but his family and his wives the our mothers and his children the, uh, the daughters of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were amongst his closest if not the closest admirers and genuinely respected him and that is something that is very very rare and it is the sign of a true person subhanallah uh, I mentioned this quote many times Sufyan ibn Uyayn has said this one of the great scholars of, of our tradition and this is a well known quote it is actually narrated from many many of the early scholars they said the people who least respect a scholar is his own family the people who least respect a scholar is his own family why is this I'll tell you why it is because the family sees the humanity of this person whom everybody raises up the family sees the flaws that nobody else sees. And so when they see people raising somebody up and they know the flaws, they can't raise him up that level. This is the reality of human existence. True respect is when those that are closest to you respect you. True admiration is when your own family admires you. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no question that his wives and his daughters, his immediate family were his most ardent supporters and followers in fact subhanallah even more so than this that to manage one family is difficult enough all of us are struggling with that to manage mashallah tabarakallah nine at one time it really is the sign of, a, of a, a, a true leader and a genius. Not just this, but when the Prophet ﷺ gave our mothers the choice, you want this dunya, I'll give it to you. Or you want me, then you will have to accept my lifestyle. You know what I'm talking about, the, the famous choice that took place, right? You want this dunya, go, I'll give it to you, and I'll give you taraq. You want me, choose this lifestyle. Ibn Abbas said, not a single one of the mothers hesitated in choosing him over this dunya. What does that show you? What does that show you? Think about it. All of his wives, all of our mothers, never once did they have a disrespect for him. Imagine that. Never once did they genuinely look down upon him. Even though marital issues happen, as we said. But even in those marital issues, there is genuine respect and genuine admiration. And that is something that cannot come from this world. It is a true prophet of Allah. No leader can have a relationship where his own wife, his own children look up to him with that admiration. This is not human. This is only from up there. And that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number 30. And we're coming to the conclusion. Point number 30. Subhanallah. The true leader is never somebody upon whom the whole mission ends with his death. The true leader creates other leaders. The true leader creates a new generation of leaders. And there is no denying that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one of the most, of course, the most successful, we will say, in creating not just a generation of leaders, not just Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum, but an entire generation of leaders that created another generation and another generation up until our times in every single generation there are true imma amongst us and they become a imma because they follow the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam leadership is given to those who value our process and follow him leadership is given and bestowed upon those who take these values and then embody them in their own lives and this is something again we don't even need to mention it is self-evident and obvious and that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam created by the help of Allah obviously all of this is Allah's will the system of Islam such that any generation will always have hundreds and thousands and millions of people that can become 
imma and role models and people that will benefit others because they are following the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact it is true to say that no system creates more leaders for its own people than the system of islam and that is the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam point number 31 my dear brothers and sisters and the final point and again i reiterate that in reality there were so many other things even today an hour ago i was deleting some of them because how much time are we going to have and we cannot do just and even these 31 points there are so many other examples that can be given for every point that are that is there and Allah understand what you cannot do in totality you do not leave in totality as the saying goes but point number 31 true leadership and the sign of a successful leader is the legacy after death what happens after you die there were some people in human history who took some of these points and manifested them to some level. There were some successful leaders polit politically or theologically or militarily. There were some groups that conquered large swaths of land. Alexander conquered much of the known world of his time. Genghis Khan created a new system. Yes, it is true. Genghis Khan created a new philosophy and a new theology almost and a new ethics and he conquered some parts of the land. But what happened? With the death of Alexander, everything fizzles out. With the death of Genghis Khan, his four sons split up and they all then continue. Each one goes their own way until their civil war and the whole thing fizzles out. With the death of the leader, the vision dies. That's not, a, that's not a fully successful leader. That is not a leader of the caliber of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many are the people that have been successful partially in their lifetimes and maybe even eked out some legacy after their death. Many. But to leave a legacy that founded not just one civilization, but many dozens of civilizations within that of Islam, Many hundreds of political dynasties, many dozens of great empires, a new culture, a new religion, a new civilization. Very, very, very few humans have ever even come close to this. And of course, they always say Jesus Christ. And I think Michael Hart puts him as number three or something. Uh, number two, I think, is Paul because he says Paul has more to the Christianity than Jesus Christ. But basically, Jesus and Paul, meaning Christianity, are put number two and three. But still, Jesus Christ, and he obviously is our prophet, we love and respect respect him but of course let's not forget he himself and his followers were not successful politically he and his followers were not successful politically in fact it was a fluke of history Allah's qadr that Constantine embraced Christianity or else it would not have happened it's just to Allah's qadr that 300 years later a pagan emperor decides to adopt this obscure religion and converts and even then <coughs> let us not forget <coughs> That the version that Constantine adopted was not the version of Jesus Christ himself. The version that he propagated, the Trinity, the triune God, the version that he propagated was not even the message of Isa. And so we cannot compare. There was no success compared to the sex success of Islam. And of course, we mean success in the worldly sense. Of course, Isa is a prophet of Allah and his success in the Akhirah is assured. But in this dunya, his followers did not succeed the way that the followers of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam succeeded. Uh, Lamartine, one of the historians of France, uh, again 300 years ago, he wrote a book called History of Turkey. And of course, you remember at that time when you say Turkey, you meant the Muslim world, the Ottoman lands. History of Turkey. And he writes in his book, philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogma, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires, He's saying 20. In fact, there's more than 20. And of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As regards to all standards by which human greatness may be, what may be measured, we may ask, is there any man greater than he? This is a powerful phrase. And we, I agree with it 100%. As to regards to all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? It's a rhetorical question. Who did more than him? Then he goes on. If greatness of purpose, the vision is large, smallness of means, very little to begin with, outstanding results are the three main criteria of human genius. This is very profound. Large vision, small thing to begin with, and uh, 
uh, and outstanding results successful who could dare compete with any man greater than that of Muhammad think about that powerful statement the most famous men created arms and empires only they founded if any at all no more than material power Alexander the Great for example right often which crumbled away before their very eyes this man meaning the Prophet sallallahu merged not only armies legislation empire peoples and dynasties but millions of men in one third of the inhabited world again he's writing 300 years ago right now it's over the entire globe and more than that move the altars the gods the religions the ideas the beliefs and the souls on the basis of a book the quran every letter of which has become law he created a spiritual nationality of every tongue and every race end quote and again this is Lamartine one of the famous historians of France and he has a book called the history of Turkey uh, I think in three volumes and this is a phrase about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one of the greatest uh, minds of the previous century somebody whom we've all heard of because of the impact that he's left George Bernard Shaw again perhaps one of the last of the great philosophers of of Europe and of England he said about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I believe if a man like him were to assume the dictatorship of the modern world and he's writing at a time when there were many dictators but he's saying I wish the Prophet became the dictator of the modern world he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring much needed peace and happiness I have studied him the man and his message and far from being an antichrist because in his time they called him an antichrist وسلم, he must be called the savior of humanity this is coming from George Bernard Shaw far from being a negative and evil person he must be called the savior of humanity I have prophesied about the faith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that it would be ex acceptable to the Europe of tomorrow as it is being acceptable to the Europe of today meaning I prophesize that Islam will spread in Europe as it is beginning to spread today. George Bernard Shaw wrote this almost 100 years ago. These, my dear brothers and sisters, are some points, 31 out of many, many more. And these points were not spiritual. They are not Allah's blessings on him. I gave that the first of the seerah almost nine years ago we talked about that the blessings that Allah has given to the Prophet system. these are not the spiritual side we're not talking about the Hawd we're not talking about Firdaus we're not talking about Kawthar we're not talking about the Shafa'atul Uzma those are a separate category and they are something that are without a doubt more important to us than these we are today summarizing and mentioning that which even non-Muslims must acknowledge that which even if you don't believe in the spirituality and the theology you must recognize that this human being sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the single greatest human being who ever walked the face of this earth he accomplished more with less and in a swifter time frame and in a more permanent legacy than any human being has ever done whether you agree or not with his teachings you cannot deny that he was the single greatest leader and most effective human being that this world has ever seen and then the question arises if you're going to acknowledge this how can you not acknowledge that he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is illogical to say as every one of these people that I have quoted have said it is illogical to say he was so great and then don't go the next step and say this must be something that the one above gave him that doesn't make any sense but such is the reality of people that they will acknowledge this greatness but then their hearts will not see the truth and this is thatika uh, this is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we come to a conclusion not just for today's talk but an entire almost decade long of lectures and legacy and speaking about especially the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and about the seerah I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses each and every one of us with a true love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pray that our Lord, even as his wisdom dictates that he did not allow us to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this world, that he not deny us to see him on judgment day. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to witness the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Qiyamah and to be called by name on that day to the Hawd. I pray that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recognizes each and every one of us from our wudu and from our salah 
and he calls us out by name to drink from the hawd. I pray that we drink from that hawd after having been given permission by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a drink that will forever and ever and ever eliminate thirst from us. I pray that we are resurrected in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that Allah Azza wa Jal gives him permission to mention us in his shafa'a and that we are granted his shafa'a on judgment day. I pray that in, in, our, in, in Jannah itself we are allowed the visitation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we're allowed to be in his company. One of the Salaf was said that in Jannah all you need to know is that in it is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask that Allah Azza wa Jal causes us to enter Jannah and to be with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to interact with him and to hear him and to see his blessed face. I pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala causes us in this world to always study the Sunnah and to always want to be eager to be following the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I pray that on a personal note as well that if I have said anything that is incorrect, that if I have ever ascribe to the sunnah or the seerah anything that was incorrect that Allah Azza wa Jal forgive me for that for it was a mistake and it was from the whisperings of shaitan and I pray that any good that I have ever done especially with regards to the seerah and the sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a means of shafa'a for me and my family and for all of us on judgment day wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen subhanak allahumma bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk my dear brothers and sisters all things must come to an end and even if I had not circumstances had not dictated that I leave this blessed community some things would have happened either you to you or to me where this would come endings are always inevitable nothing lasts forever other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-baqa'u lillah everything perishes except for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my beautiful time in this community is coming to an end and I leave with great sadness and it is truly a sadness and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that the brotherhood that we had the camaraderie that we had the true good times that we had that we cherish them in this world and that we maintain them in the Akhirah as well I pray that all that we have done especially in this masjid and especially in this community I pray that inshallah ta'ala it continues to be a source of inspiration for us in this world and a source of blessings for us in the next life how many times we have come together in this place, how many lectures have been given, how many of us have joked and bantered together. And subhanAllah, this is the reality, as I said, that even if I didn't leave physically, something would have happened, even if it's just death, whatever, this is the reality. But those beautiful moments, they are preserved in the Loh al-Mahfuz. And as we know, the, in Jannah it is mentioned, and the Quran mentions this and gives an ishara, that because time is eternal and memories are perfect every single incident will be remembered by the people of Jannah of this world every incident and so I pray that every single interaction we had inshallah we will reminisce about it in Jannah to Firdaus Al-A'la that as we have gathered here today together so many times some of us mashallah for all nine years some of you were here in the beginning left others have moved in the middle others have moved and left this is the reality that people keep on moving but every time we were here we gathered together for the sake of Allah I pray that our intentions were sincere and that we did something truly for the sake of Allah that some blessing and khair was uh, brought about by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my words are coming to an end as you can tell I am babbling and that is because I am uh, emotional at this time um, we have had my wife and I and my children have had a beautiful time in this community uh, I feel that we will not face the same love and the same respect anywhere else that I go and it is with great sadness that uh, this is coming to an end in any case, Allah Musta'an wa alayhi tuklan. And insha'Allah ta'ala, even if my physical uh, place in Memphis is no longer here, insha'Allah, my heart will encompass all of you, and your hearts will encompass us, insha'Allah, I know. And insha'Allah, visits will be there regularly. And insha'Allah, I am confident that our paths are going to cross. But I will miss uh, this facility and this masjid. And I know that insha'Allah, next time I come, it will be in the next facility inshallah that is my goal inshallah please don't disappoint us now inshallah that after all these years inshallah we want to now have the new the new place inshallah open up so inshallah 
Inshallah. Well, then that means even quicker. Make sure that the place is opened up. There's more of a, a burden on you. Uh, Allah Musta'an, may Allah Azza wa Jal accept all that we have done, all of us, all of us, not just me, all of us that we have done. Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiul alim, wa tub alayna, inna ka anta tawab rahim On behalf of myself, my family, all four of my kids, sincerely, jazakumullahu khayran, I thank each and every one of you for giving us this beautiful opportunity. This has been a beautiful time of our lives. Uh, no doubt the best time of my life was Medina, there's no question. But after that, these last nine years that I have spent, uh, I shall always cherish them and I will always have the fondest, fondest, fondest memories of my time here. And with that, inshaAllah ta'ala, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال